Joshua, it's great to be here. Uh, hopefully you can all hear me, hear me and see me okay. I'm sad not to be with you in person, particularly as I actually live just up the road, um, just outside Oxford. Uh, but hopefully uh, next year uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be together in person. Um, I'm excited to be with you today to talk about a subject that's very close to my heart, which is why this is the best time in history to, to start a company. Uh, so what, what I want to do over the next 30 minutes is sort of walk through the case for uh, why uh, there's never been a better time to, to start a company uh, and what implications that, that has for you as you start to think about uh, your career. So um, hopefully you can also see my screen. It looks like you can, which is great. Um, so let's start by um, introducing me and uh, Entrepreneur First. Uh, who am I? Why am I here? Uh, Joshua gave a very kind introduction, but let me take a step right back. Um, Entrepreneur First is the world's first talent investor. Uh, I started Entrepreneur First almost 10 years ago with um, my co-founder, Alice. And when we started it, it was generally seen to be quite a weird thing. Um, talent investing is is a new kind of venture capital, which I'll go on to explain. And you know, I think people thought that we were kind of crazy to to try it. Um, Ten years on, things look very different. But before I jump into what we've done so far, let me try and explain the problem that we were solving. Uh, as you probably know, I think all good all good entrepreneurship is really applied problem solving. It's about seeing a, a way that you want the world to be different and, and making it happen. So the problem that we wanted to solve is we believe that the world is missing out on some of its best founders. That might seem sort of a strange thing to say. You know, if you read TechCrunch or Hacker News today, it feels like every day you're reading about another uh, company raising money, launching, um, becoming a unicorn, going public. You know, how can we say the world's missing out on its best founders? But I think one of the strange things um, uh, about entrepreneurship is that it's a little bit of a bubble. Um, you know, the, by very fact of being at this conference, it's quite likely that you are in that bubble. You, know, you probably read about entrepreneurship, you read about startups. But actually, entrepreneurship is still not very mainstream. Um, those of you who are undergrads will know that, you know, there's a lot of members of Oxford Entrepreneurs, but probably many, many more of your friends and colleagues will go into investment banking or consulting than, than actually start a business. Um, by the way, uh, I, don't, I don't blame people for doing that. That's what I did too. I, I started my career at McKinsey um, uh, in London when I, when I graduated. And we think there's nothing wrong with those jobs. Uh, in fact, they're great places to learn, uh, great places to, to, to build a, a great set of friends and a network. But when you zoom right out and think what is the social consequence of so many of the world's most ambitious people being drawn into traditional careers, not just in the UK, but around the world, what we see when we see that is companies that the world is missing out on, companies that never get started because their founders get locked into a traditional career. Uh, and by the time they think they might be ready to start a company, it's too late. They're, they're already... Um, uh, that they're, they're already locked in and, uh, you know, they feel like they can't afford to lose their job. They've got uh, financial commitments or they um, simply uh, no longer, you know, have the desire. And so our mission at Entrepreneur First is to make sure the world doesn't miss out on those, uh, on those founders. The challenge is that traditional venture capital firm, you know, obviously invests in companies that already exist. But if you're trying to make sure that the world doesn't miss out on its best founders, you can't wait for companies to exist. By definition, uh, those companies are, are companies the world isn't missing out on. So we do something quite different at EF, which is we're a talent investor. That means that we invest in people, pre-team, and sometimes pre-idea. In other words, we back individuals before they have a company purely on the basis of their talent. At the time that we make our decision to invest in them, we don't know who they're going to work with, and often we don't know who they're going to, uh, what they're going to work on. Um, it really is going back to basics and saying that startups are about people, and we believe that we can identify those people very, very early before there's anything uh, to look at, and uh, actually make a make a bet on an individual that you know hopefully on average goes on 
to be very successful. Now, you can probably tell why 10 years ago when we said we were going to do this, people were a bit skeptical. It hadn't been done before, and in many ways, it breaks a lot of the conventional wisdom of uh, venture capital. Um, you know, if you Google old blog posts from Silicon Valley, you know, about startups, you know, people would say things like, you know, you should never invest in, in companies which were founded by strangers where they didn't know each other. Uh, you should never invest in uh, people that haven't worked a lot together before. You certainly shouldn't invest in people who don't know what they're going to work on. EF breaks all those rules. And as a result, it was pretty tough at the start. You know, we spent actually two or three years sort of grinding through, not being able to um, uh, raise a lot of capital and, you know, kind of wondering if we were if we were crazy ourselves and if we were doing completely the wrong thing. Uh, fortunately, it, it looks a little bit different 10 years on. Today, Entrepreneur First is, I think, the best place in the world to find a co-founder and then build a company and access the world's top investors from scratch. Um, and, you know, we really believe very strongly in this idea of finding co-founders. We, yes, we back individuals before they have a company, but we think that maybe the most important thing that we do is embed them in a community of people like them uh, and allow them to find the co-founder that will turbocharge their ability to build a company. We think that, um, you know, there are some exceptions, but in general, um, starting a startup is, is too hard for one person to do by themselves. Co-founders are incredibly important, particularly when you know, a product or an idea needs a, a blend of skills that, that don't exist in one person. Um, we really, um, we, we really think that's where uh, the magic happens is when two people with different skills come together to start something. And so, you know, if you're looking to build a company and you don't have a co-founder, we think that EF is one of the best places uh, in the world to find them. Now, fortunately, um, in the last 10 years, um, EF's gone from being a crazy idea to one with, with a pretty strong track record. Uh, Joshua mentioned some of these numbers in the past. I must have given them a little while ago because I'm excited to say things have moved on quite a lot since then. Um, we now um, have over 3,000 alumni um, 350 companies created and, and over 3 billion of portfolio value, which is uh, a number that's increasing rapidly all the time. And that number will be well north of 4 billion before the end of the year. So I think EF's gone from quite a crazy idea that people thought would never work to, to one that actually not only is working, you know, EF itself is now a, you know, a reasonably uh, big company. We have 130 people across the world. We run uh, programs in six sites in London, but also in Paris, Berlin, Singapore, Bangalore, and Toronto. Um, we manage um, several hundred million of um, institutional capital. And, you know, I think it's gone from something that people thought would never work to something that people want to copy. And, you know, we're proud to have imitators around the world now. Um, a few of our success stories, Joshua already mentioned these, but um, here are some of the um, early uh, wins out of EF. I love this story of, of Magic Pony technology. It's um, actually a few years old now, um, uh, but it's a, it's a crazy story that I think illustrates just how quickly uh, technology allows people to, to build something really meaningful. Um, the people that you see on the screen here uh, on, the, on the left is Rob Bishop. Uh, on the right is Zihan Wang. They met on our program back in uh, late 2014. Um, Rob was a, um, a fresh graduate out of Imperial uh, where he'd studied um, electrical engineering. Uh, and Zihan had just finished his PhD um, where he um, was, was doing a PhD in medical imaging. They, they met Entrepreneur First. Uh, after a few weeks of the program, they decided they were going to work together. And they started building um, a company that they called Magic Pony Technology, uh, a somewhat silly and, and now very memorable name. The idea of um, Magic Pony Technology was that, um, you've got to remember this was, this was uh, now sort of six years ago. So um, the deep learning revolution in, in artificial intelligence was, was really just getting going. They realized that you could um, use uh, deep learning to actually uh, improve uh, video compression. So effectively allow you to, through a technique called super resolution, uh, send low res video over the internet and um, receive it on the, on the other end as, as high res. They um, started working on this. Um, they, we funded them in December of 2014. They did our demo day in March of, of 2015. 
raised a seed round in August of 2015, and then in uh, June of 2016, uh, Twitter bought them for $150 million. So incredibly fast turnaround, less than a year from the, the seed round, only 15 months from uh, from our demo day. And, and, you know, these guys have built something uh, pretty significant. Um, what I love about the story is not just that, you know, these guys made a lot of money very quickly, um, but it radically um, accelerated EF's own journey and put us on the map. But maybe more importantly, it's really exciting to look at what the guys went to do on, uh, go on to do next. So they both went to work at Twitter. Um, Rob's just left Twitter, where he rose all the way up to being uh, vice president of consumer product at Twitter. So if you use Twitter, you've um, used stuff that, that Rob's been working on. Uh, but more importantly, from our perspective, uh, both Rob and Zihan became investors in EF, which was, a we think, the ultimate validation. And Rob is now one of our venture partners advising the companies that, that go through the program. So we love that story, and there are there are uh, we're sure that's uh, there's many more like that to come. Um, another company that I think you'll be hearing a lot about over the uh, coming year is Tractable. Tractable um, joined um, well the founders who you see at the front here, Alex and, and Razvan, joined EF um, at the same time as Rob and Zihan. They um, start building a, a company that again used um, uh, computer vision models to uh, evaluate um, insurance claims. So if you crash a car, rather than have someone come around and inspect it, um, you have, uh, you simply take a picture of it and Tractable's uh, AI uh, evaluates the, the claim. Um, they start very small again, sort of they raised a seed round in, in, 20, uh, in 2015. Uh, today, the company um, serves almost all the biggest insurance companies around the world, both in uh, in the US, in Europe, and in Asia. And uh, I suspect um, this company will be a unicorn by the end of the year. It's um, accelerating at an extraordinary pace. Uh, just one more example before I sort of jump into the uh, why to start a company, a company that you may have come across called Clio, also built at Entrepreneur First. Um, Clio is a uh, financial assistant that uh, talks to you through a, through a chatbot interface. Um, we funded Barney to build Clio in 2016, and um, it's pretty extraordinary uh, to see how fast that's grown. Millions of people around the world now use Clio. It's raised um, uh, about $60 million of venture capital so far. And again, I think we'll see a, a, a big, big um, advance from Clio uh, in, in the coming months. Built 300 plus other companies, uh, many of which are, are pretty exciting and, and well known. But um, we hope what it does is it validates the approach of, uh, of talent investing. And um, you know, I think if we continue to see the growth that we've seen so far, we hope that talent investing will gradually become mainstream and that um, the world will uh, not miss out on its best founders, but actually many more companies that otherwise wouldn't exist uh, will be built. So, you know, today, EF, we're fortunate not only to get to work with great entrepreneurs at the beginning, but to be backed by some of the world's greatest entrepreneurs. So um, one of our biggest investors is Reid Hoffman, who um, led our last fundraising round and joined our board. As many of you know, Reid is the founder of LinkedIn, which eventually sold to Microsoft for $26 billion. Um, we are also uh, fortunate to have as investors people like Peter Thiel, one of the founders of PayPal, first investor in Facebook, Demis Sarbis from DeepMind, Tavit Hinrichus from, from Wise, uh, formerly TransferWise, and many, many others. So we like to feel we have a, a pretty unique perspective on, on company building. And what I want to do um, for the next sort of 15 minutes is just talk through why I think um, now is the time, maybe the best time in history to start a company. So how do I think about this? I would start by um, making a big and bold claim, which is that you know today in 2021, entrepreneurship is the best tool for ambitious people to scale their impact. So if you're a person that wants to have a lot of impact in your career, I would argue that today you cannot ignore entrepreneurship as the best way to do that. Now, when I talk about impact here, the reason I use that word is I think you can measure that in a number of ways. Um, for some people, that will mean making lots of money. Uh, for some people, that will mean um, changing the world uh, in some way. For some people, it will mean maximizing the amount of good they do. 
they're all, I think, you know, legitimate aims. Uh, and what I think is exciting about technology entrepreneurship today is that whatever kind of impact you're looking to have, entrepreneurship, I think, offers a way to do it. So let me explain why I believe that. Um, first, I want to zoom right out and talk about ambition. I believe ambition is one of the most important ingredients in successful entrepreneurship. Uh, building a company is really hard, and you have to be thinking big from the start if you're going to attract the people that you need to come work with you, the capital you need from investors to, to fuel the journey. And I think this is a kind of constant through history. Um, throughout history, there have been ambitious people. What's changed over time is how ambitious people can best uh, maximize their impact. Um, you know, today, as I'm going to argue, that might be entrepreneurship, but obviously a thousand years ago, there were still ambitious people, but they weren't becoming tech entrepreneurs. So let me try and walk through what I mean here and, and, and you know, why I believe this. One of the important ideas, I think, to get your head around is, is what I would call the technologies of ambition. What do I mean by that? For me, a technology of ambition means the tools or processes or structures that ambitious people use to maximize the impact that they can have in the world. Um, you might think of these as social technologies, ways that people um, have impact beyond themselves. If you want to kind of make this feel very real, you know, imagine that you were born a thousand years ago into a medieval village. It would have been really hard to have a big impact. Um, there just weren't any tools that let, allowed you to have impact beyond the people you met every day and the, the physical world that you interacted with every day. Over time, I would argue the history of the world is sort of the history of new technologies of ambition that give people leverage, that give people reach. But let me give you some examples. So one of the most important um, turning points in history was the rise of literacy, being able to read and write. I would argue that literacy is a technology of ambition. It's a tool, social technology, that allows people to have impact beyond themselves, beyond their immediate person and the people they meet. If you can write down instructions, if you can write down arguments, if you can write down ideas, then as long as there are people that can read them, that allows you to have impact beyond your immediate self. It's a very powerful social technology. And if you look at the history of ambitious people, say, thousand years ago to 500 years ago, literacy was very much the, the tool that people used. You know, if you weren't, ha didn't happen to be born into a royal family, you didn't have many options other than literacy. And, you know, therefore you see throughout the medieval period, lots of ambitious people go become um, priests, trying to become bishops and archbishops. Why? Probably not because they were especially religious, although they may well have been, but largely because this, the technology of literacy and the, the power and reach, institutional reach of the church gave people scale and impact. Uh, example I always like to use, if, you know, if you're from the UK, you've ever been to Hampton Court, huge palace in southwest London. That was built by a guy called Thomas Wolsey, who was born son of a butcher in Ipswich, a, a little town on, on the east coast. And um, he rose to become the most powerful person in the country after the king. How did he do that? Basically because he harnessed the power of literacy. He was able to read and write, and that gave him leverage. Now, over time, literacy became commonplace and there became more powerful social technologies. Another example would be military command. You know, so for most of the early modern period, one great way to have impact beyond your immediate person was to command an army. Um, you know, people like Napoleon... Uh, obviously famous for this. This is how did they, how did Napoleon maximize his ambition? Through through having an army, um, through knowing the, the, the technology, the social technology of military command. Um, again, very different from uh, the technologies we usually think about today, but these are technologies that, that gave people leverage. Um, next, you know, kind of fast forward into the 20th century, finance becomes a very powerful social technology. Remains so today, as I suspect, I don't know, but my guess is that still um, probably one of the most, maybe the most popular um, graduate destination for, for Oxford undergrads is to go work in an investment bank. Um, why? Because it is a very powerful social technology. It gives you extraordinary reach. If you can write a check in London to finance a project anywhere else in the world, you don't have to physically be there to have impact. 
your impact scales through the social technology of finance. So over time, these technologies have developed to allow ambitious people to, uh, to maximize their reach. But I think that the, the dominant social technologies of our day, things like finance and management, are actually giving way to entrepreneurship. And actually, the, the coming decades are really going to be the decade where it becomes very obvious that the most ambitious people should be founders. So one way to think about that is that the technology of ambition itself is being disrupted. We talk about disruption a lot in entrepreneurship, the idea of changing, overthrowing the established way of doing things. I think one of the things that technology is overthrowing is the established way of doing careers. It's still very prestigious today to go work for a, a Goldman Sachs or a McKinsey or even a Google, but arguably what's chipping away at that is the, uh, the opportunity to actually start your own company. So if entrepreneurship is the new technology of ambition, why is that and, and, and how does it work? The way I would think about it is that there are three big benefits that technology entrepreneurship has embedded in it today, uh, which are unprecedented. One is scale, one is scope, and one is low cost. So I'm going to quickly walk through those three things, and then hopefully um, I won't have run over too much and take time to answer your questions. So let's talk about scale first. Um, technology enables global scale. Um, we're sort of used to this today, so it seems unremarkable. But this is very new in human history, the idea that you can have permissionless global scale without having to sort of invade a country. Um, technology has a naturally global reach. Um, and it's happened very, very quickly, this phenomenon. It wasn't true when you know, my parents were uh, growing up that technology was obviously global in scope. One way of thinking about it is just think about the internet. Um, look at how many people have got online so quickly. You know, in 1995, there were very, very few people online. There were about 50 million people. You see that tiny little orange uh, bar. Um, but yet, that must have seemed at the time like the most extraordinary opportunity, 50 million people. Today, though, we obviously laugh at that. You know, by 2000, there were 500 million people. 2014, there were sort of nearly 3 billion. Uh, and today, there's sort of 4.5 billion people online. Um, they are all the potential audience, the potential market for any product or service that can be delivered over the internet. That's an extraordinary growth of scale in really a very short period of time, you know, in a sort of 25-year period. Probably the biggest opportunity for scale in history. Smartphones, even more extraordinary. There were no smartphones in 1995. There were no smartphones in 2000. And yet by 2014, 2 billion people had them. And today it's pretty close to 5 billion, particularly if you include the sort of um, feature phones with some smart features. It's, it's really extraordinary to think that you can now reach billions of people from something that you make in your bedroom. Facebook is the ultimate example of this. Two billion people every day use Facebook products, uh, something that starts in a bedroom. This is, again, I'll say this is the biggest opportunity for scale in human history. And I think it's hard to ignore. It, whatever your ambitions are, um, if you want to achieve something at scale, the power of the internet to give you scale is unprecedented. Secondly, scope. Um, what do I mean by scope? Well, historically, one of the things that um, would shape what career people took was what their interests were. You know, if you were interested in, you know, a particular uh, sector, then you should go and work for a company in that sector. You know, if you were interested in transport, go work for a transport company. If you were interested in hospitality, go work for a hospitality company. What's happened, though, in the last 20 years is this idea, which Mark Andreessen, a very well-known entrepreneur and venture capitalist, calls software eating the world. And as software eats the world, what you see is that more and more different kinds of ambition can be achieved through building technology. Um, it almost doesn't make sense to think of technology as a sector anymore. Everything is becoming a technology company. And what that means is that almost any problem, almost any challenge can be uh, achieved through building technology companies. Maybe the two most obvious examples, I said in the past, if you wanted to work in transport, go work for a transportation company, if you want to work in hospitality, you work for a hospitality company. That's no longer true. You know, in the last 15 years, 
the the two uh, two of the biggest technology success stories were Airbnb that gradually is eating the hospitality sector and Uber gradually uh, eating the transportation sector. Both ultimately software companies built by software entrepreneurs, not hospitality entrepreneurs, not transportation entrepreneurs. Software is eating the world. And now almost any ambition that you have, almost any interest that you have can be uh, pursued through the lens of technology entrepreneurship. Finally, cost. Um, you know, in the past, it was the case that um, one of the reasons that technology entrepreneurship was maybe less attractive or less accessible to people was it just cost a lot of money to get started. It's kind of something that people who are already rich could do. Um, that's changed really fast. I remember early on at EAF, one of the people that we got to come in and, and speak to the cohort was a, a guy called Ed Ray, who's one of the founders of Betfair. Uh, Betfair is uh, you know now a... Uh, part of a public uh, publicly traded company, a very, very large um, gambling company. And he told the story about how to build Betfair. He had to raise a million dollars before he started so that he could buy the physical servers on which Betfair was going to run. Today, no one does that. And uh, Today, Amazon and Google and Microsoft will compete to pay you, at least to, to begin with, to use their cloud services. No one buys physical servers and actually... The big tech companies want to pay you to use theirs. Um, obviously, eventually they uh, they charge you. But uh, at EF, for example, uh, AWS gives credits to uh, to everyone who joins, as I think does Microsoft. Um, so that cost has fallen off a cliff. Um, at the same time, the rise of things like open source software, um, software that's freely available to reuse, means that you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time you want to build something. You can think of what we call combinatorial innovation, innovation that is about taking building blocks of people's work and only having to uh, really build something new at the very cutting edge of what you want to achieve. These have all had the uh, impact of reducing cost. Um, at the same time, the rise of, I guess, organizations like Entrepreneur First, as well as other accelerators and venture capital firms, there's never been more capital available to entrepreneurs that want to start their journey. This is part of a broader trend. I mean, many of you um, will will have seen this chart uh, before. This is um, uh, Moore's Law, which shows how um, transistors per microprocessor, so roughly equivalent to processing power, has um, doubled every two years now for a very long time. Now, there's some speculation about whether that can keep continuing from now, but this is one of the big drivers in reduced cost. Um, the fact that it's processing power has got cheaper and cheaper over time, um, has basically unlocked a lot of innovation that wouldn't have been possible otherwise. Like two of the examples, I in fact, actually all three examples I gave of EF companies earlier on were companies that use machine learning very heavily in what they do. Uh, machine learning is a great example of a technology where the ideas were around for a long time, but the computational power to make them work has only just become accessible, and the cost of that has fallen and fallen. Um, I think what's really exciting right now, if you take the sort of software uh, eating the world idea again, is this isn't just affecting things that are obviously digital technology. Here's another one. The cost of sequencing a genome has fallen even faster than Moore's Law um, over the last 20 years. Um, and this, this is really important stuff. This is, is changing the way that we think about biology. Um, very strongly related to this is things like the creation of the um, messenger RNA vaccines for, for COVID-19, possible because the cost of sequencing has just fallen and fallen and fallen. So whatever you, um, whatever kind of company that you want to start, the barriers to getting started have never been lower. I think if you take those three ideas together, ever bigger scale possible in terms of the outcomes and reach for what you do, ever greater scope in terms of what kinds of ideas you might want to work on being possible through technology and ever lower cost of getting started, lower barriers to entry for entrepreneurs. What this means is that it really is a golden age for technology entrepreneurship. One thing that you know we exist to do is to really try and democratize access to uh, this field. It's pretty um, amazing to me to think that in the past, 
you had to be rich to get started. Uh, that's terrible. That definitely means the world's missing out on some of its best founders. There's no reason to think um, that your starting level of wealth should predict how good you are as a founder. So one of the things I'm proudest of at EF is that we actually pay people to start companies. So we pay individuals a stipend before they even know what they're going to work on uh, to give them time, space, uh, and access to get started. Um, even you know, even if things don't work out, obviously it means that they've you know had that period um, fully funded. And you know, we do that at the very earliest stage. But there are also more venture funds than ever before ready to step in and fuel things that are working. So I do think that in terms of uh, accessibility, it's never been greater. I'll stop there, but uh, the I guess the idea I want to leave you with before we move to questions is that it really is um, a special moment in the whole of human history. I feel, uh, at risk of sounding uh, glib, I, I feel really happy and fortunate and excited to be alive right now. I think um, the companies that we'll see built over the next decade will not only be very valuable, but I think will change the world in really important ways. Um, hopefully building, you know, a sort of uh, a richer, more inclusive, healthier, happier world. And if you want to uh, do that at maximum scale, I think technology entrepreneurship could be for you. I'll stop there and take any questions that you have. Right. Uh, yeah, sure. yeah, thanks so much for, for this speech. I think it was great. So yeah, guys, um, on the stage, uh, I, on the stage banner on the right side of the screen, um, feel free to just post your questions in the chat. Um, and I think Matt, you can just choose questions to, to answer. Yeah, I actually had a, had a bit of a question myself that yeah, um, go for it. in considering, so like whether I should go into entrepreneurship or not, like, as I said, I, I'm actually going to intern at an investment bank, which I think it's the common option. <laughs> Um, so yeah, as in, in terms of like, you know, sec job security in terms of, um, financial compensation, I think, um, for Oxford students, I guess it's a lot easier to choose a more traditional path. So what, what, what incentive is there to really go for like, you know, the more risky, but perhaps more rewarding path in entrepreneurship? That's a great question. So let, let me unpack that into two different ideas. So one is about, um, financial upside and one is about, um, security and maybe i'll take the security one first so i think one of the myths of entrepreneurship is that um it's very risky now that might sound controversial so let me explain that the company level it is very risky most startups fail so um it's certainly true that any given startup very high risk um which is why people like me who invest in startups we invested in lots of them because no, no one can know whether any given startup will succeed However, at the career level, it is not that risky. What I mean by that is there is no or very little um, cost, personal cost to failing as a startup. So, you know, founders that fail don't find themselves unemployed because of what we call the ecosystem uh, of support around them. So actually what's exciting about this moment, particularly in the UK, true in many other ecosystems as well, is that there are now so many comp technology companies, so many startups rather, um, so many VCs that actually a very high value is put on people who've tried and, and failed to build the company. So I've never seen a problem for a founder where they end up unemployed after uh, you know something doesn't work out. In fact, it can be an amazing career accelerant to be a founder and, and have things not work out in that people see... Um, you know, people increasingly see what value uh, you can bring because they can see what you've built. And I think this is an important idea. The difference, you know, in traditional careers, a lot of what people are looking for is how you signal um, value. So, you know, what does your CV look like? Where else have you worked? Um, you know, kind of what grades did you get? All these things, I'll call these signals. By contrast, entrepreneurship is not about signals, but about demonstration so people in startups tend to care less like where you went to university 
and more. What have you actually done? And so, you know, if you excuse my language, I think what's nice about startups is if you can, it cuts out a lot of the bullshit that comes with with careers in the, um, it, if you're someone who likes to build, likes to make things, likes to make things happen, um, actually building a company is one of the best ways to demonstrate value to other people. So, so I do think, um, I think um, in terms of security, I, I think it just shouldn't be high up many people's worries when it comes to starting a company. Um, obviously, it's not, I, I don't want to be um, glib about it. It's not a pleasant experience if you spend five, six years building a company goes to nothing you know like i don't want to diminish the uh how hard that is but i do think that um in in terms of like does that mean your career is over uh, absolutely not and that, that's the power of an ecosystem now in terms of like the financial side i think look i think um it really depends what you're trying to maximize so i think clearly um if your main goal in life is to you know, maximize lifetime income with as little risk as possible, you're probably going to work in traditional finance is the best solution for that the world's ever come up with. Um, I think what entrepreneurship has that's quite different is a different risk reward profile. I mean, if you look at the list of you know, one extreme, you know, the wealthiest people in the world, they're not investment bankers, right? They're, they're entrepreneurs. Um, it's Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, etc. cetera. Um, now, obviously there are tiny, that, that is a tiny, 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 tiny proportion of all the people that, that start companies. But, you know, I do think what entrepreneurship gives is, is sort of the, the power and power to get to an unlimited upside with, with like relatively little um, barriers. Now, again, I don't want to pretend that happens to everyone. It absolutely doesn't. But, you know, I would say the expected value of entrepreneurship for people who are very talented and ambitious is pretty high. The other thing I would emphasize is that even some of the like failure modes in startups can be quite lucrative. So, you know, probably the only other industry that has comparable um, salary uh, remuneration expectations to investment banking is the big technology companies. And, um, you know, I, I think in general, they're, they're a pretty good fallback option for um, people that start a company and it, it doesn't work out. Um, you know, again, I don't want to be, I don't want to be um, glib about it. Obviously like failure is always an unpleasant thing, but I, I don't think, you know, personally, my view is it's, it's a pretty amazing uh, sweet spot in terms of, yeah, you're, you're not going to be uh, getting six figure bonuses, um, you know, in your sort of third year of starting a company. Um, but on the other hand, you could have built billions of, not billions, millions of dollars of equity value by then um, in a way that's very hard to replicate elsewhere. Um, I, I suppose the other thing I'd say finally on that, thinking about the trade off is that one of the things that, um, I and I think others have found frustrating about um, traditional careers, even when they're very lucrative, is that often the way you um, the way you succeed, particularly early on in your career, let's say the first decade, is is by trying to make your boss look good. That's the that's the success factor. Is if you make your boss look good, then you get you know they they're on your side. You get promoted. You get bonuses. Whatever. I think what's really refreshing about entrepreneurship is it's not a game. There isn't a mark scheme. There isn't like a sort of, you make me look good, I'll make you look good. It's like, can you build something that people want? Can you build something that people want enough to pay for? Uh, if you can, the rewards are enormous. And I think that's the, you know, something that I hear a lot of entrepreneurs talk about is that sometimes it just feels very real. Like, it's like, there's no, it really just to come down to like, can you solve people's problems enough that they're willing to pay for them? If you can, that's quite a nice way to make money. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not denigrating other ways of making money, but there's something quite um, quite satisfying about that that maybe is lacking if you're, you know, uh, working in, I don't know, a hedge fund or whatever. That would be my answer. Right, yeah, th thanks a lot. I think a lot of food for thought for students like myself. Um, all right, so maybe you can just move on to the next question. And perhaps I can ask the audience to maybe thumbs yeah. up.
It was a question from Alexa. How do you do due diligence and investment risk assessment on something with as many variables as an individual and their talent? Great question from Alexa. So I think there are a few ways to think about this. Um, the first thing I'd say is that the reason talent investing works is because of the asymmetric nature of the bet that you're making. So um, what you obviously can't do due diligence in the traditional sense. You know, we can't, there's not, there is no company. You know, we can't look at revenue. We can't even look at market. So what we're really saying is how much option value do we see uh, in this person? Um, the great thing about venture capital is you can only lose one times the amount of money that you put in, but in theory, you can make a thousand times the amount of money um, that you uh, that you put in um, if it works. So you know, you take our investment in Tractable that I mentioned. Um, you know, Tractable, the share price for Tractable today is about a thousand times what we what we paid on the way in, which is kind of amazing. Um, so what we're really looking at is building a big. Um, we're basically building a community of individuals where collectively we believe there's something um, it's very likely that given the talent um, available, they between them, they will build something that pays for everything else um, put together. So, you know, you take Tractable, um, that cohort uh, had 50 people in it. Um, we funded, I think, I think we funded maybe 28 of them. Uh, we paid stipends to 50, funded 28 of them, so 14 companies, because it's always pairs at EF, um, of which I think nine raised a seed round. Um, then Magic Pony exited, which I already talked about. Tractable, it's worth a thousand times what we paid. And there's a couple of others that's still there that are worth maybe 10 times what we paid. So overall on that cohort, we've made sort of 20 times our money, um, even though there was a lot of failure. And so, you know, I think the key is not, doing due diligence. It's not saying what could go wrong. It's saying what could go right. And I really like this aspect of my job is my job is not to worry about the downside. My job is to worry about the upside. And, you know, because we you know now have thousands and thousands of people have been through EF, we have probably the world's biggest data set of what founders look like before their founders. And that gives us the opportunity and the, the ability to, to make reasonably accurate evaluations of, of whether there is upside potential early on. I'm sure we could get better at it, um, but you know, effectively we've, we've narrowed it down to a small number of criteria, four criteria that we use to, to evaluate whether we see upside in, a, um, in, in an individual. Hopefully that answers your question, Alex, but feel free to follow up in the chat if um, you want me to um, jump into that. Right, sounds good. Um, actually, I think I'm going to switch my camera off and Matt, you can just choose the questions which uh, you feel are most suitable. All right, so I think because uh, the audience would rather just listen to you. Any other questions? Hmm. I think the short answer is no. Um, you, you know, there are lots of um, opportunities for uh, non-technical founders, um, just generally because ultimately business building is still business building. That said, I think that the opportunities for technical founders are, are truly astonishing. Like if you can build something that other people can't build, particularly at speed, um, I think you have one of the best opportunities in, in human history today. So in general, I, you know, if I were, if I were advising a sort of 16 year old today, I would certainly aspire, um, uh, advise them to uh, try and build a technical skill um, as well as sort of broad, you know, sort of interest in the world, because I think, you know, the rewards to being able to build are, uh, are higher than they've ever been. Um, you know, one thing that we do at EF is, is obviously like build co-founding teams. So we're pretty um, thoughtful about what kinds of uh, founders should go together. Um, you know, we, we do skew very heavily towards technical founders, about 70% of our cohorts would be, would be technical. But um, we 
Um, but we, we absolutely find non-technical people as well. I think the key question for a non-technical person uh, to ask is always, what do I bring to the table? Like if I were trying to, if you were, if you, I'm, by the way, I'm non-technical uh, largely, um, but you know, but the question would always be, what, what do you bring to the table that would encourage, um, you know, a CTO um, or, a, you know, a, a technical co-founder to, to pick you? And if they're going to, if you're going to split a company 50-50 with something, someone, like what, what is your value add that you're bringing? Um, so, yeah, I think, I think it's a good question, but, and, you know, certainly I think the rewards to being technical have never been higher, but equally, um, I, uh, I don't think it's like a closed shop if, um, if that's not your background. So Matthew asks, do you think there's any limit on when a person can become an entrepreneur in terms of their education, career development, or age? Um, I'd say not really in either direction. Um, we, um, you know, the way I would think about that is that um, probably the biggest mistake people make when thinking through this is they think that there's going to be some point where they suddenly feel ready. Um, you know, they're like, oh, I'm not ready to be a founder today, but, I, you know, I'll feel ready in future. My experience that just never comes like, you, you, your sort of abilities as a founder are generated by getting started. Um, it's almost um, it's almost impossible to have all the skills and all the experiences that you willing need uh, and encounter, say, in a decade long entrepreneurial journey at the beginning. So, therefore, it's much better to be um, a great learner than it is to have all the skills. So, you know, we've funded people at EF who are as young as, I think, 18 and as old as 67. Um, we, I, I think there's really no um, hard and fast rules. What we say is that everyone, every great founder needs to have an edge. What is an edge? We mean like a personal competitive advantage. And I think if you have an edge um, that is uh, distinctive, that, that makes you uniquely well qualified to build something in particular. It doesn't really matter how old you are. It doesn't matter what stage of your career you are. It doesn't matter you know, what education you have. It's really about, again, I go back to that idea we discussed before, you know, what uh, it's about really like proving value rather than signaling value, demonstrating value. Hopefully that answers the question, Matthew. Um, we then got an anonymous question, which is, Someone who, like many founders, started their career in banking consulting, would you say that these typically two to three years of learning in such organizations are necessary for aspiring founders? Um, no, definitely not. Um, I, th I think it's really important not to confuse um, selection effects for treatment effects here. What do I mean by those? So, you know, you could look and say, wow, loads of founders seem to have done consulting and banking. The question is, is that because treatment effect? consulting and banking made them better founders or selection effects, those people were attracted to consulting and banking to begin with. My very strong view is that it's the latter. It's a selection effect. And, you know, the main, I think, proof point for that is if you look at Silicon Valley as a place where actually, you know, banking consulting are much less prestigious relative to starting companies, you know, a much smaller proportion of uh, great founders there relative to say the UK have those backgrounds. So I'd say it's more that because consulting and banking are su such a sort of talent suction machine, ambitious ambition magnet in the UK, um, they attract the sort of people who uh, later decide, actually, wait, I don't want to be in this. I want to build companies. I don't think it's the, it makes them better founders. I think that said, you know, there's lots that you do learn in those professions that, that are valuable. Um, but in general, I think any learning rich environment where you're, you know, exposed to people and ideas is going to be um, uh, is going to be a great preparation for being a founder. Uh, Yusuf asks, "How is the mental health of entrepreneurs at EF managed? Being the entrepreneurship can be a stressful experience. Absolutely, um, be entrepreneurship is very stressful, and um, I think this is a really important question. Actually, something that we're thinking about a lot at the moment, and it's sort of, I almost, it's almost like I planted this question, which I didn't, but we, we just started a pilot." Um, with a founder psychologist uh, offering basically support to all our founders um, uh, around the world, um, separately from the advice that we give to, to companies and you know the sort of mentorship and coaching that we give, 
Um, we're working with a, a leading psychologist called Gina Golan, who's basically providing sort of mental health support office hours to entrepreneurs at EF. And I think this is really important. I think, you know, it's fortunately, I think we've moved beyond the era where sort of talking about mental health is, is stigmatized or seen as a sign of, of weakness. Um, instead, I think, um, you know, it's, it's, it's recognized that manage actively and proactively managing your psychology is, is a sort of secret weapon for founders. So yeah, great question. It's something we're thinking about a lot at EF. Um, Matthew says, what sort of returns are you looking for and what's the shape of that? The context being presumably that at some stage of the town needs to pay back the investment you've made in them. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. So uh, a quick zoom out. We, you know, the money that we invest both in stipends and in, in the companies that we invest in come from large institutions primarily. So, you know, we, we're currently investing out of a fund of $140 million dollars of which 90% of the funding comes from large institutions, foundations, endowments, insurance companies, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds. And, you know, they, they invest in venture capital as part of their um, uh, overall uh, portfolio. They're looking for a you know, return across everything they do. And venture capital is attractive to them because the returns can be very high. There's lots of downsides to venture capital for them. It takes a long time. It's high risk. It's illiquid can't just sell your stake in a startup because you want to, you've got to wait for it for an exit. And so they, in return for those downsides, they require a very high rate of return. You know, really those, those institutions want us to give them three times their money back at least over a 10 year period. So, you know, when we think about um, the returns that we're looking for, you know, that, that would be our baseline goal to uh, return three times the money in, in, in 10 years. And so, um, when you think about how that happens, it doesn't happen that every startup returns three times. Uh, in fact, it's very, very skewed. Roughly, I would say in startups, you know, sort of 90% of the outcome comes from 10% of the startups. So, you know, if you invest in 10 companies, you'd expect probably seven to not return you any money, you know, one or two to return you somewhere between one and three times the money you uh, invested. Um, and then hopefully the 10th one returns you 20, 30, 40, 50 times the money that you invested. And we sort of think of that as a power or distribution where the tails are very fat, um, meaning that you get some quite extreme outcomes. So I already walked through one cohort example where, you know, you have one company that looks like it will, one EF company tractable that will probably return a thousand times what we invested. Um, and that will pay for everything many, many, many times over. And so that's how we think about it is, you know, like we're very relaxed about things not working out. Obviously, we want people to succeed, but you know, one thing we would never do is give people a hard time for failing and losing our money. That's that's what happens. So, really, the key is to find the companies that can be globally important winners and you know be worth you know hundred, two hundred, three hundred times um, what we what we put in. Hopefully, that answers the question, Matthew. Um, Jack says, "What are the most important metrics to show that your product works?" There's no easy answer to that because products are so different, but I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, I mean, I think it, it really depends what sort of um, problem you're trying to solve. Um, if, you're, if you're trying to solve something where you're creating a new customer behavior, consumer behavior, you know, really what, you know, the sorts of metrics that we use to, um, to, to measure that are things like um, engagement and retention. So how, um, when someone you know, starts using your product um, or service, you know, how many of those people are still using it a week later, a month later, two months, three months later. So call that kind of cohort retention, like when people joined and um, sort of for a given cohort of individuals that joined at around a time, like how many of you are still using that over different periods? Um, engagement is obviously like how much time people spend using it, how they use it, how many interactions they have with it. So all sorts of ways of measuring that. Things like um, dividing your daily active users, how many use it every day. So how many use it on a given day by your monthly active users. So trying to work out how sticky it is in that sense, that's useful. For other products, like if you're selling enterprise software, software to big companies, then 
you know, you're probably looking at more things like churn. So, you know, like, do people stop paying for it and, and cancel their subscriptions? So uh, I'm not being very helpful because it's so broad, but there are lots and lots of different ways to measure it. And it really depends on the kind of customer and the kind of product. Hopefully that's helpful, but happy to provide some links to ways of thinking about this um, later. Another question from Matthew, if you have a small number of selection criteria, is there a risk you create that identical entrepreneurs? Is there really a type or can entrepreneurship accommodate a wide variety of characters? Yeah, it's absolutely the latter. Like um, entrepreneurs are hugely diverse as a group across multiple, multiple dimensions. Um, the number of things that founders have in common, it's actually quite small. So it's sort of slightly challenged the premise of the question in that I think you actually want to have a small number of criteria rather than a big number. Um, if you have a big number, then then there really is a danger that you try and make everyone fit a single um, type. Whereas actually by having just four, we're saying, you know, we're pretty sure that all founders need to be smart. Uh, all founders need to be skilled. Um, all founders need to be ambitious. All founders need to um, sort of have a, what we call a, a drive to achieve. But beyond that, founders come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and you know, as I said, like age is, is very diverse at EF, um, background, education, all these things. I think um, founding a company, is, one of the things that makes our job interesting and hard is that there isn't a type. And actually, if you, I think whenever people index too much to a particular type, that they end up um, missing, missing out on, on really great founders. Uh, Jonathan asks, acquiring top talent is notoriously one of the toughest thing for early stage startups. How does EF support their companies with this? Um, again, this feels like a question that sounds like I planted because uh, this is one of the things that I think is the most valuable thing about EF and one of the reasons that EF is successful and also why EF is very popular with very, very, very good founders is that it is incredibly hard to hire uh, top talent as a startup because you can't match the salaries that a Google or a Facebook that can pay and often it looks very risky um, at the start. So how does EF help with this? Well, basically because we invest in talent, but not all the talent ends up succeeding as founders, a very common path for people who work at EF, uh, sorry, join an EF cohort and don't successfully start a company is to go work for an EF startup. And uh, this is an amazing source of talent for EF companies because not only is it highly screened on the way in, EF is extremely selective. We get thousands of applicants um, every year for, for the London program. But of course, if you've worked in you know, the same building with someone for six months, you got to know them really well, you know what they're capable of, you've seen what they can build, um, your risk as a founder in hiring them is a lot lower. So there's both access, filtering, and, and sort of observation mean that um, such a common route for people to go work for other EF companies. All right. All right. Thanks so much, Matt. And unfortunately, we've come to the end of um, our session. But thanks so much, Matt, again for coming here and yeah, teaching us so much about entrepreneurship and how EF works, and also for the audience for participating actively and asking uh, really great questions. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed it. And um, Hopefully back next year in person when we're all vaccinated. Yeah, for sure. Really looking forward to having Inspires in person soon. All right. Yeah, so much well, if anyone wants to contact me and follow up, they can easily find me on Twitter. My DMs are open. So I'm um, just at Matthew Clifford. Feel free to follow up on that. All right. Okay. Yeah, we have come to the end of the session. So right now we'll be taking a short two-minute break before we continue with the Forbes 30 Under 30 panel. <laughs>